My classroom is a ribbon of oasis stretched across a desert landscape. It is that way because where I teach, it is alongside the Rio Grande or sometimes even in the Rio Grande or in the forest that goes by its Spanish name, Bosque. My students have had the opportunity to track change caused by the ecological drivers of flood and fire and climate and human alteration. When volunteers like myself or my students collaborate with scientists to do environmental monitoring, it is known as citizen science. And the work that I do with my students is all about collaboration. In partnership with the city park, a national wildlife refuge, and a high-tech startup firm, two of my students, Nanda and Mirabel, spent all of December in the late afternoon trekking alongside the Rio Grande and getting water samples. They were looking for gasoline contamination and other hydrocarbons. They did that work even though Mirabel fell into the river once and had the ice knocked around by her, by her hands as she did that. So they were able to continue because it was important to them because they knew that it had meaning beyond their classroom. Five of the samples would eventually test positive for hydrocarbon pollution, including the one Mirabel had rescued. Earlier this month, the girls traveled to Arizona and they presented their findings to a conference of scientists. Some of the work my students do is just like that, a splash in time. Others extends out a longer period. For over 12 years, my students have uh, trapped and radio collared porcupines. They find the porcupines perched up in cottonwood trees, 30 feet off the ground. Now you may ask, how do high school students capture and radio collar a porcupine? Exactly, very carefully. Not all of the animals that we trap provide such hazards to our students. We often set small drinking cups in the sand, buried right at the rim of the cup. And the ants and the other creatures come along and fall in. When they do that, my students are able to grab them and identify what creatures have fallen in. One of the most interesting ones is the acrobat ant. It's got a heart-shaped abdomen, and in times of flood, it grabs all of its contents of its colony, all the little ones that can't crawl on their own, and they climb up the side of a cottonwood tree to wait out the flood. I kind of wonder what that porcupine might be thinking as it looks down at this invasion of little ants coming up. For over 20 years in the Bolsky Ecosystem Monitoring Program, my students and I have had the opportunity to do real science, to be, allow us to be citizen scientists. This work is in my blood. My great, great, great grandfather, Thomas Meehan, was a prominent 19th century botanist. He analyzed the plants collected by Lewis and Clark. He corresponded with Darwin. Me being a science teacher, having grandpa me and his kin is pretty darn wonderful. Grandpa Meehan also ran a nursery. He sold plants all over the country. One of the plants he sold was the tamarisk or salt cedar, a plant he described as great for windbreaks and a beautiful ornamental with feathers and pink flowers. But like Grandpa Meehan who arrived on a ship, the tamarisk was not from here. So Grandpa Meehan and his tamarisk both arrived from another continent to what to them was a new world. But it wasn't a new world. We already had here in North America our own native plant and animal and human communities. But that did not deter Grandpa Meehan or his offspring or his tamarisk. We did spread and we did grow. So in time, 100 years plus later, here I am along the banks of the Rio Grande with my students. And we ask, what trees grow here? What happens if a fire comes from there? And why are those native cottonwood trees being displaced by, you guessed it, Grandpa Meehan's tamarisk? And that, in a nutshell, is the issue of the day. For better or for worse, 
with good intentions or bad or no intentions at all. We humans, we humans just grab a hold of wherever we are and alter that landscape and spread upon that land and multiply. This is not new to us. We've been doing this work for a long time. Let's look at the last 13,000 years, using my arms as a timeline. 13,000 years ago, the last ice age was ending. And we were using this technology, this Clovis point, to accelerate the extinction of woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats and ground sloths the size of hippos. And as the climate became more stable and things became warmer, we domesticated plants and animals and started to take more nutrition that way. And as we got to about 5,000 years, we no longer had um, the need to be running all over the place. So we had large cities. And by the time we kept moving along to the last 2,000 years, well, we found something else. Because in the last 200 years, that's when we got a hold of hydrocarbons and really went to town and started burning them at a rate that caused all sorts of problems. So now instead of imperiling the woolly mammoths, we now are imperiling those polar bears and about a quarter of the other species on this planet. So how do I, as a science teacher, get my kids to see change across time? How do I help them see to lift up their eyes from the screen to the forest from whence cometh their oxygen? How do I help them to understand that the river that they draw their water from and drink from may not exist in their lifetime because we dewater it and climate change? I do it one bug at a time by using those simple little buried cups in the sand. My students are able to go out and when times are flood and, and there's plenty of water, they find those acrobat ants. In times of drought, they find the acrobat ant's cousin, the harvester ant. And by keeping track of the ratio of the dry ants to the wet ants, my students have bioindicators to allow them to understand what is taking place. They learn systems and relationship, cause and effect. It's far more important to have a personal connection with an acrobat ant in your own backyard than it is to have angst about a polar bear distant thousands of miles away. For me and my students, what is so important to us is making those individual connections to understand that the relationships that we have with those little animals that are just trying to scurry away out of harm's way are part of a larger circle and a part of a larger life cycle that we must protect for all. And ultimately, what I really hope for my students is what I'm hoping for myself, is that by doing this work, we can atone for the ecological sins of our grandparents. <laughs>